morning, everyone. Let me begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks for your many and gracious promises. We know that you have promised to be with us when we gather in your name. Lord, please be with us now as we look at your word. We ask that you'd reveal your truth to us by your spirit. Shape us by it. Change us. Help us to walk in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you're here last week, you'll remember that the passage began, that we looked at last week, began with the phrases, These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac. It's there twice, isn't it? Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac. And as we've looked at already with Ben, you know what family likenesses can be like. Father and son can be so similar. Years ago, our eldest boy, Peter, he went to a cricket camp at the Gold Coast and he stayed with my uncle. And he, when he came back, he said for the whole weekend, Uncle Charlie called him Phil. <laughs> Apparently we're a bit alike. That likeness is in the genes, isn't it? But in our reading today, there is so much behaviour that is familiar. So many situations in which Isaac, Isaac behaves like his father. Isaac had plenty of advantages. He was not the idol worshipping wanderer that Abraham was when God approached him. Isaac did not start out in the same place as Abraham. Through his life, Isaac has already seen plenty of the evidence of God's grace and God's faithfulness in his life. Isaac has been there. He's seen his father grow and grow in trusting God. As a young boy, he's obediently journeyed up a mountain with his father and when he gets there, God provides a ram to be sacrificed in his place. And we saw last week how all these advantages, all this evidence of God's goodness, led Isaac to respond to Rebekah's barrenness, his wife's barrenness, in faithful prayer and trust in God. And he has the response of God. God's goodness demonstrated to him in answered prayer. Now our passage today is the only chapter of Genesis that is focused on Isaac. We had that little interlude we looked at last week, but the narrative quickly turned to Esau and Jacob, didn't it? Today we get to know Isaac a bit better. And what we see is just how much like his father he is. But let us remember, remember always that the Genesis account is the account of God acting in the world. Now we're people and we identify with the people far more quickly and far easier. But the Bible is God's revelation of himself. God speaking to us about himself. So let's turn to chapter 26, beginning at verse 1. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm just going to read a few beginning verses and we'll look at some more as we go through. So, Genesis chapter 26, beginning at verse 1. There was another famine in the land, in addition to the one that had occurred in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, at Gerah. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land that I tell you about. Stay in this land as an alien, and I will be with you and bless you. For I will give all these lands to you and your offspring, and I will confirm the oath that I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky. I will give your offspring all these lands, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring, because Abraham listened to me and kept my mandate, my commands, my statutes and my instructions. So Isaac settled in Gerah. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, 
she is my sister. For he was afraid to say, my wife, thinking, the men of the place will kill me on account of Rebekah, for she is a beautiful woman. When Isaac had been there for some time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from the window and was surprised to see Isaac caressing his wife, Rebekah. Sounds so familiar, doesn't it? Like we've read it before. There are so many events in this chapter, not just here, that mirror what happened to Abraham. So many actions that are replicas of what Abraham did. Doesn't Isaac sound like his old man? Same frailties. The same fear when he has a beautiful wife in a strange land. The same crazy scheme to save his skin. Now before we delve into the passage a bit more, let me put one thought to bed very quickly. Some commentators think that these events are so like what happened to Abraham that they must be the same events recorded a second time, but this time happening to Isaac. We have a famine with the appearance of God making the same set of promises. We have the same people names, Abimelech and Phicol. We also have the same deception with his wife. But against all that, we have a clear statement in verse 1. There was another famine in the land, in addition to the one in Abraham's time. These are different events, very similar but different. Now, in this part of the world, a famine is hardly a surprise. The land in the south around Bathsheba is very dry. It's not on the edge of the Negev Desert, it's in the Negev Desert. If you want moisture, you've got to go to the north, towards the Sea of Galilee, or to the west, towards the Mediterranean. More rainfall in those parts of the world. And I went there once, it is astounding, the difference. It changes so rapidly. 100 kilometres and the rainfall can go up 300 millimetres, 12 inches. So you haven't got to go far. And Egypt, well to the west, that's where the Nile is, isn't it? There's always water in Egypt, even in the worst drought. So a famine is hardly a surprise. So in response to this famine, another famine, in addition to the one that happened to Abraham, Isaac moves to Gera. Now Gera is slightly further north and west. More water. Slightly wetter in Gera. It appears that Isaac's intention is to keep on going towards Egypt. But God appears to him here in Gera and tells him not to go. Stay here in the land. The land where you are dependent on what I provide and I will bless you. How would you react to such a promise? You know the Nile is there to the west. You know there's water there. God has said, stay here. The only time the creek runs in Gera is when the unusual event of rain occurs. It's not running now. There's a famine. What would you do? God says, stay here. In the land I will give your descendants and I will bless you. Would you trust God or would you keep going to where you know there is water? Now when God gives Isaac this instruction, he also graciously renews the much larger promises that he'd given to Abraham. Why repeat the promises? He thinks God's forgotten what he promised? Of course not. God is ensuring that Isaac knows that the promises haven't died when Abraham's died. Little Israelite children hearing this story around campfires 
would be reminded that God's promises are not extinguished just because Abraham has died. They are still in effect. All the elements of God's covenant, covenant with Abraham are repeated. Land, numerous descendants, blessing, and being the avenue of blessing to all the nations. All of God's promises remain. Isaac listens. He hears God's promises and he acts in faith against what he sees in the world around him. He stays at Gera. He acts by faith, not by sight. But Isaac's no picture of perfect faith, is he? He's so like his father, so like a son of Adam. Last week, Bernard reminded us of that great book, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. If you've read it, you'll know the children who travel to a strange and wondrous new land called Narnia are known in that land as the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve. We know that Adam was the first man, the first man to sin. And if you've read those passages carefully, you'll know he's the first man to fear. Here Isaac is a true son of Adam, a son of Abraham. He fears the men of Gerah and their power over his life. When the men of Gerah ask him about Rebekah, he lies to them in order to keep himself safe. With certain differences, the events recorded about Abraham in chapter 20 are, are here again. Abimelech discovers that Rebekah is Isaac's wife. Abimelech comes to confront Isaac about his deception. But in this account, Abimelech makes the discovery for himself. God doesn't reveal it to him. And in this account, Abimelech is the one who makes institutes the death penalty if anybody touches Rebecca. Remember in the other account, it's God who brings in that death penalty. Why the difference? I think it's to highlight the contrast between the behaviour of Isaac and the behaviour of Abimelech. It's much greater here. And it only increases our awareness of how weak and sinful Isaac is. Here he is in Gera with all God's promises now made to him. These promises are fresh in his memory. He's acted in faith by staying there. But then what does he do? He falls to his fear. The fear of men. And he lies to protect himself. And then Abimelech acts so well in response to Isaac's lying. What is God's response? He remains faithful and blesses Abimelech, uh, blesses Isaac. Reading from verse 12. Isaac sowed seed in that land, and in that year he reaped a hundred times what was sown. The Lord blessed him, and the man became rich and kept getting richer until he was very wealthy. He plants a crop in the middle of a famine and harvests a hundredfold. God blesses Isaac with great wealth. The Philistines round about become jealous and Abimelech asks him to move away, just as Abraham was asked to move away. And we go on to read about the conflict between the Philistines and Isaac over the water wells, and it's so reminiscent of what happened to Abraham, isn't it? But what we are meant to see, I think, is that Isaac's sin has not diminished God's grace. Through, I, through God's blessing Isaac in the face of his sin, we get a renewed appreciation of God's forgiveness 
and faithfulness to his promises and renewed appreciation of who God is and his character. And when we've sinned, do we remember that? Do we remember what David said about the character of God? But with you there is forgiveness. Do we turn back to him? Do we trust in who God is in his character and repent and seek his forgiveness? Or maybe, maybe we focus on what we see as how big our sin is. Oh, God couldn't forgive me. And we forget who God has revealed himself to be. As Isaac digs digs the succession of wells, he moves further and further south until he's out of Philistine territory and well into the Negev desert. He's south of Bathsheba, drier and drier. And still, God blesses him with finding water every time he digs a well. Now, we should not underestimate the significance of that, of continually finding water. This is a very dry environment. Eight inches a year or less, 200 mil. The importance of finding water in that environment, it means life for people and for livestock. It's such a great material blessing. And Isaac can see that this isn't luck. He's not some great water diviner. He knows where this success comes from and he acknowledges it in verse 22 when he says, For now the Lord has made space for us and we will be fruitful in the land. It is impossible to miss how good God keeps being to Isaac. God has renewed his promises, repeating them directly to him. God has kept him in the land where the king has dwelt with Isaac much more fairly than his lives deserve. God has blessed Isaac's crops. God has repeatedly given him water whenever he digs a well. And now, now, God appears to him again and gives him such a reassurance such an antidote to his fear. In verse 24, Fear not, for I am with you and will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. What a promise. God's omnipresent, isn't he? He's everywhere. This is not that sort of with you. Here is a promise of closeness, of personal presence and favour. Fear not. I am with you. And as if that's not enough, shortly after God sends Abimelech as a witness, a third party witness, who can see clearly the source of Isaac's wealth and success just in case Isaac can't see it for himself. There's a lesson here for us too, this testifying to each other about the goodness of God. It's a way of helping each other in our doubts and our fears, in our weaknesses and our failings. When was the last time you mentioned to a Christian brother or sister how you could see God at work in them? Blessing them. When was the last time you talked about the blessings of the Lord? It's such an encouragement and such a help when our church family remind us how God is at work among us. I'm at the last point on the outline. What are we to make of all this? Isaac has so many advantages, so much to recommend him. 
Yet he is a son of Adam, a son of Adam, the son of Abraham, like father, like son. Even with the promises of God still ringing in his ears, he fears. Does it sound like you? Does it sound like these times? We too are sons of Adam. How is God to bring about his blessing of the nations, his reversal of the effects of sin through weak, fearful, sinful sons of Adam? Our Father in heaven is good, isn't he? There is one sinless man who, although a son of Adam, is also the son of God. He lived the perfect life. He is the one who's the exact likeness of his heavenly father. God provided a ram as a substitute for Isaac. God has provided his own son as a substitute for those who trust in him. Christ was the spotless lamb that died in our place. I'm going to read those verses from Romans 5 again, beginning at verse 15. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if by one man's trespass the many died, that's the trespass of Adam, how much more have the grace of God and the gift which comes through the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflowed To the many. And the gift is not like the one man's sin, Adam's sin, because from one sin came the judgment, resulting in condemnation. But from many trespasses came the gift, resulting in justification. If by the one man's trespass, Death death reigned through that one man. How much more, much more, will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? This free gift, this grace, overflowed to the many. Sin came through our father Abraham. We are his children. But God's free gift overflowed. It drenched. It washed away. It cleansed. Cleansed us from our sin, and in its place it brought righteousness. There's much more to learn from Isaac's experience, isn't there? With all those promises fresh in his memory, he still feared, he still sinned. We have so much evidence of God's goodness. Much more than Isaac had. God's interaction with Isaac is one of the evidences we can look to. Yet we still fear. These times are hard. We're not long out of a terrible drought. Hopefully we're near the end of a very nasty mice plague. The world at large is struggling with a virus. The geopolitical situation seems more dangerous than it has for a long time. And families seem more fractured than they have for a long time. We are so blessed where we live, and yet, and yet, so much anxiety, so much fear, 
so much uncertainty, so much worry. And God's people aren't immune from that fear. God had a reassurance for Isaac and he has the same reassurance for all his people. Fear not. I am with you. He said as much to his people in Isaiah's time. Christ says as much to all who are his. The last words Matthew records Christ saying have such comfort and such strength. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What a promise. A promise of closeness, of personal presence, of personal favour. The sinful who are unfit to be with a holy God are given the free gift, the grace of being made fit for God's presence, of being righteous. Fear not, for I am with you the God who is perfectly faithful, has promised that he is with those who are his. So, brothers and sisters, fear not.